world today. The field of medicine is an ever-expanding one. Countless people visit doctors regularly. A patient undergoing a medical procedure might think nothing of signing a consent form, but where exactly did the notion of required patient consent come from? The answer to this question might come as a surprise to some. To quote Dr. Arthur Kaplan, an esteemed expert in biomedical ethics, the whole discipline of biomedical ethics rises from the ashes of the Holocaust. Medical ethics as we know them developed as a result of the Nuremberg trials, sometimes referred to as the doctor's trial, a series of trials of war criminals following World War II. Many of the Nazi war criminals who were on trial conducted gruesome medical experiments on unwilling inmates from concentration camps. Most of the victims of these experiments were Jews, Russians, Gypsies, and Poles. Nazi doctors intentionally wounded and infected inmates and tested different methods of sterilization on them. In some cases, Nazis would drive pieces of glass and wood into patients' wounds to mimic battle wounds. The doctors submerged some inmates in ice water for hours, then attempted to revive them. Tests were done to ascertain how well patients survived at high altitudes, and some inmates were forced to drink seawater to establish if it could be made safe for drinking. Other inmates were subject to brutal experiments in bone transplants and muscle regeneration. These horrific experiments were conducted without the consent of the inmates, many of whom were killed in the process. Following these and other war crimes of World War II, it was evident that the criminals needed to face repercussions. But how did the Allies reach an agreement on how to take action? Many options were discussed and considered, but the influence of one man in particular provided the impetus for the trials. That man was Associate Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson from the United States. Robert H. Jackson played a major role in the formation of the International Military Tribunal and the trial of Nazi war criminals, eventually leading to the development of the Nuremberg Code. The International Military Tribunal was the judicial team formed by the Allied forces to try war criminals following World War II. An intelligent and well-respected orator, Jackson had been appointed by President Truman as Chief Prosecutor for the United States in the trials. In the summer of 1945, Jackson traveled through Germany to find a site for the trials and decided on the war-torn city of Nuremberg, a city where the Nazi party had previously held rallies. The venue Jackson chose for the trials was a building known as the Palace of Justice, which was large enough to accommodate many people and could be renovated to serve as a courtroom fairly easily. The trials began a few months later, in November. 22 Nazi officials were put on trial, including Martin Bormann, who was missing at the time and was tried in absentia. The Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, Germany, once the holy city of Nazism, becomes the setting of an epic event. Here, under the vigilant eyes of Allied military police, the 20 most important surviving members of the Hitler gang go on trial. The attention of all the world is centered on this city and this scene. High representatives of France, Britain, America, and Russia form the tribunal. They will judge the ringleaders of a conspiracy that brought war to all the world for their crimes against peace and humanity. Jackson delivered the opening statement in which he referred to the trial as the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world. During the course of the trial, evidence was given regarding the Nazis' use of slave labor as well as their brutal mistreatment of concentration camp inmates and civilians. One piece of evidence was a letter written to Heinrich Himmler regarding attempts to sterilize inmates using x-rays. The letter suggests that surgical castration would be more efficient than x-rays. 
Video footage of German soldiers shooting innocent civilians was also provided as evidence. Between the physical evidence provided and testimony from the witnesses, the appalling cruelty of the Nazi regime and their disregard for human life were plain to see. There were a few defendants who expressed sorrow for their actions and renounced Hitler's philosophy. Others, however, would not admit that they had done anything wrong and insisted that they had simply been following orders. There were also those who claimed they had no knowledge of the Holocaust and were not important enough to have had any influence. On October 1st, 1946, the International Military Tribunal announced the verdicts of the trial. Three of the defendants were acquitted. Franz von Papen, Jalmer Schacht, and Hans Fritschke. Twelve defendants were sentenced to death. Three received life sentences in prison, and the remaining four received prison sentences that ranged from 10 to 20 years. Fifteen days later, on October 16th, the prisoners who received death sentences were executed. Hermann Goering swallowed a cyanide pill and killed himself before his execution. And Martin Bormann, who was sentenced to death in absentia, was still missing. The remaining ten defendants were hanged. After the execution, the bodies were cremated and the ashes placed in the Iser River. The defendants given jail time were sent to Berlin to carry out their sentences in the Spandau prison. Robert H. Jackson was the driving force that brought the trials into fruition. The Allied leaders had diverse opinions on how to punish war criminals, and there was dispute over which method to use. Through his determination and sound reason, Jackson was able to facilitate an agreement between the Allies. Due to his guidance and his desire for justice, Nazi war criminals were given a fair trial rather than simply executed without thought. One major effect of the trials was the development of the Nuremberg Code. The war crimes that Nazi officials committed were deplorable and demonstrated a flagrant disrespect of human rights. The hideous experimentation conducted by Nazi doctors was particularly awful, and the Nuremberg Code was created to prevent such atrocities from ever occurring again. This list of medical ethics made informed patient consent a requirement for all medical procedures. Although it was not actually law, but more like a list of suggestions, the Nuremberg Code did much to shape and inspire current rules of medical ethics, and its influence can be seen in standard regulations of biomedical ethics today.